Welcome everyone to Fundamentals of Kabbalah and Hasidut, continuing our series on creating a life of joy. Tonight we're going to begin with uh, some what we'll call obstacles or impediments to being a joyous person. And then we're going to go to uh, short ideas about joy, uh, almost all of them from Rav Ginsburg. And that will be our, our class for tonight. I do want to mention now, and I'll mention later, this will be our second last in this series. Next week will be the last in the series of creating a life of joy. Okay, so <laughs> let's start with a number of uh, impediments to being a joyous person. And that is, and I, I'm sure everyone at different times has felt this, but if one doesn't like themselves, it's very hard to be joyous. In other words, if someone has low self-esteem, and as the word means, self-esteem means how you look at yourself. It might be tremendously influenced by how you imagine other people relate to you, but self-esteem means this is how I see myself. And so therefore, uh, it, it's, it's pretty obvious that if, we're, if we don't like ourselves, we're not satisfied with who we are and what we've accomplished and what our choices have been and all, everything that goes along with that, it's very hard to uh, have any semblance of, of joy in one's life. So therefore, that's, that's it's a, a very, very important starting point is that uh, we simply need to like ourselves. Now, like everything, everything has to be balanced because if we're doing all kinds of morally and ethically wrong things and we're not making good decisions and we're overly influenced by others, so, what has to happen is we have to make tikkun. We have to rectify the situation. So there are times when we make mistakes or have moral lapses or religious lapses or spiritual lapses that we, what's called, we give, we give ourselves musar. <laughs> we, we admit that we did wrong and we need to fix it. But here we're talking about in a very, very general way that when a person is just looks in the mirror and just doesn't like what they see. So it's, it's obvious that it would be very difficult to have any kind of joy in one's life. And so along with this goes the idea we're all human. We all do make mistakes. We all do have what we need to fix and rectify and improve. But that doesn't mean that we have to be down on ourselves all the time. So again, when we, if we make a mistake, we have to admit it and we have to, we have to fix it. But this is just a, a very almost obvious idea but a lot of people, let's be honest, don't necessarily like themselves. <laughs> and obviously it would be very hard for other people to like them either because that's the energy they're putting out. The energy they're putting out is not uh, very positive. It's not very uh, um, inviting. So again, this is, we've been dealing with many, many different uh, obstacles or impediments to being joyous. So this is the first one we're mentioning tonight. 
We need to not be so down on ourselves. Okay, the next one is a much bigger uh, type of subject here, and that is being a victim. Or not so much being a victim, but feeling like a victim. And this is a, a very, very important subject to, to deal with. Now, there are people who are victims, and probably all of us at different times have been the recipient of energy that at the moment we are a victim. But in the bigger picture, there are people who are born blind, there are people who are born deaf, there are people born with all kinds of uh, genetic um, problems. Um, there are people who are, who are abused, who are raped, who are mugged, who are um, attacked. These, these are real victims. But then the question is, does that victimhood stay with us the rest of our lives? That is the question. And so the, the reality of, of things really going wrong in our life uh, way outside of our uh, ability to control them. This is just part of being alive. But ultimately, we live with ourselves. So ultimately, it's us who decides whether I'm going to adopt a victim stance for the rest of my life because of what happened other people are not are not real victims like the list we just gave of, of rape, mugging, murder, blindness, deafness, genetic disease, etc. But uh, take upon themselves the the attitude or the sense that I'm a victim. And when one is a victim, first of all, they don't feel in control. I have been victimized and there's nothing I can do about it. And there are forces much greater than me. And I, I, I will be a victim forever because of X, Y, or Z. So a person feels they're not in control. That leads to a general attitude that I'm being unfairly treated. God is unfairly treating me. The universe is unfairly treating me. Society, etc. And this, of course, leads to great anger. That anger could be uh, subsumed within and comes out in all kinds of ways, including physical disease. When we swallow anger, it's going to come out somehow. And if we can't express that anger or work through that anger or fix that anger, in many, many cases, this is actually very connected to the weekly portion of Tazria, where we're dealing with a physical skin ailment, skin disease, that our sages tell us the root cause of it is, is spiritual. And it's coming out in a physical way. So in Dennis Prager's book, so he identifies five different types of, uh, of, of victimhood. And all of these are, are not in the same category of people who have been violently uh, abused or the, the whole list that we gave before. 
This is more people who have run into obstacles in their life, like everyone. But instead of dealing with it, accepting it and working through it, um, uh, treating it with a, a grain of salt, have let it uh, infuse their entire being and they feel like they're a victim. So these are the five that he brings. And there, there's uh, so many of us have uh, experienced these things. The question though ultimately is the only one in, in the ultimate sense who makes us a victim is ourselves. Because uh, with all the, the factors and influences coming from the outside, that still doesn't determine if we're uh, happy or well-adjusted. I think we brought the example before of Natan Sharansky, who spent years in isolation, nine years in prison. And in his book, he says that from the moment he decided that he is a Jew and I, he identifies as a Jew, and he's going to leave Russia, and he's going to come to Israel. He says he became a free person. And the whole time he was in jail, that he, in his mind, he is an absolute free person. So the same idea is with victimhood. Is just like he was in jail for nine years, things happen to us that are, sometimes are, are terrible things outside of our control. But ultimately, we decide our attitude towards it. So the first type that he brings is someone who feels they were mistreated by their parents or in their upbringing. Could have been from teachers at school, from brothers and sisters, grandparents, parents, but people who... Uh, are, like, mark themselves for their whole lives because of, and, and again, admittedly, they might have been very unpleasant um, situations. And children many times are abused by parents. It could be physically, it could be sexually, but in most cases, it's just simply emotionally and psycho psychologically. But, <coughs> excuse me, but many times this sticks with a person. And so for the rest of their life, they uh, like adopt a victim attitude because of, again, uh, uh, admittedly negative experiences. Other people could have gone through the same kind of experiences, but never wanted or were willing to take on the, the role of victim. The next one are people who are part of a group that in, in reality could very well be um, victimized. Uh, uh, African-Americans for a very long time experienced slavery. The Jewish people have experienced thousands of years of oppression. Many women have experienced all kinds of um, unsensitive remarks or actions. Any minority group in, in a country and, and feels the, the sting of racism so all of this, anyone in this group can either adopt an attitude of being a victim, which will color how they relate with everyone always, or people who accept and, 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 and deal with being a minority or an oppressed group 
but don't take upon themselves that in every encounter, they are the victim. Then he mentions people who are different. People are very short. People are very tall. People are very overweight. And examples like this, where people, because they don't fit into the, you know, typical stereotype of whatever <laughs> we're supposed to look like and, and uh, appear like, but many, many people, it, it, it colors everything about every relation that they have. They feel uh, victimized by the fact that they're overweight or short or um, poor eyesight, whatever it is, whatever it is. And then uh, Dennis Prager brings a fourth category of people who are super sensitive to slights that uh, feel that just anyone who says anything that may be construed as some kind of insult or uh, derogatory statement and is in a sense looking for it all the time. And it brings up anger and defensiveness. Sometimes we are the, the, the victim of, of people's insensitivity. It happens sometimes, many times every week, people say things that are, are not the most sensitive and make us maybe feel bad. But again, the decision is, do, do we let it churn our insides for days and weeks? Does it ruin a, a relationship forever? One statement that maybe shouldn't have been made, but was made, and that's, that's it. I'll never talk to you again. Or people who maybe are a little bit more balanced and, and mature can chalk it up and, and has the right to even uh, speak out and, and, and say, how could you say such a thing? <laughs> like, where are you getting off? But there's a different that in saying, I'm never speaking to this person again. I'm never going to a restaurant again because this waiter um, talked harshly to me, whatever it is. And then the last one is, uh, call it the realm of, of excuses. Uh, an example is someone uh, is very irresponsible at work. They're just, they're, they're just there because they, they have to pay the rent and they're really not a good worker. They cut every corner they can they even do things that are not all that ethical. And somewhere along the line, it catches up to them and they're fired. And then they rail against the employer. And again, they, they adopt the position of being a victim when it's really just a deserved consequence for their own actions. And this happens all the time. Now, if, if, if we look at all of these, I would imagine most of these things have happened to all of us many times. People saying unsensitive things had, you know, maybe not the best um, upbringing that we, wish it could have been a little different. Um, maybe we are a little bit different. Uh, we belong to a minority group in the world. But ultimately, and that's the, the uh, important thing to say here, it's easy. In fact, many, many people 
again, not consciously, but unconsciously fall in to the identity of being a victim because it's easier than the emotional, psychological work that it takes to overcome many of the challenges of life. And so instead of working on ourselves, working on being able to deal with the ups and downs of life, it's just easier to, I'm, I, I'm a victim and that's just what I am and nothing ever goes right and I don't like myself so much because of it. And this is, this leads to self-pity. And then we are in a, a, a terrible cycle that uh, will not allow joy or happiness to seep through the cracks. So that was the, the big obstacle I wanted to present tonight. And it's, you know, it's the same thing with depression. For many, many people, it's, it, it's just easier to, to be depressed than do the hard work of creating a life of joy because that was almost the first thing we said in this series, that being joyous is hard work. And in a sense, it goes against our nature. All of the things that we just mentioned that happened to all of us at different times and different degrees, ultimately, though, the choice is ours how we deal with it. Just for example, if someone, let's say, is born with some kind of malady, it could be they're, they're, they're blind, they're deaf, um, crippled, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and you have two people like this. You can have one person who lives a very, very bitter life. Their whole life, they are just bitter about their circumstances in life. And you can have someone else born with these same um, uh, challenges who not only rise to the occasion, but become uh, very successful and uh, everything considered well-adjusted and even joyous. It's, it's more than possible. There, there's so many real cases that we know in the world of this. It doesn't mean that they're happy all the time. But there is a big difference of living a life of, of, of bitterness and anger and a life of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the best of the hand that I was I was given. And like I said, we probably all know on a personal level in history, there's many, many famous people who had great challenges, enormous challenges. Challenges that we could ask ourselves and 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 say, if I was in the same position, would I have the strength to overcome all of this. Okay. Now, as we've been doing, we've been, the first half is usually about different obstacles to being joyous. And then we want to move into those attitudes that we can uh, adopt that can help us lead a life of, of joy. So the first one, and the main one really, the main one 
for tonight is a sense of meaning and purpose in life. This cannot be emphasized enough how important it is to feel that one has a meaning in life, one has a purpose in life, and that one's life is meaningful. Not just to me, but to people around me, and ultimately to God. So, um, one second. I'm just trying to think of a name here. Why does it escape me? Okay, someone's going to put it in the chat real fast. Um, a... a Jewish psychologist who went to the death camps. And he, thank you, Victor Franco. Thank you, Dara. Victor Franco, who spent a substantial time in the death camps. And from his experiences, he wrote a very, very famous book, uh, Man in Search of Meaning. And his whole uh, psychology was based on, on what he saw, what he experienced. And he saw that those people in the camps who, uh, and, and we, we have no, uh, uh, no right to judge anyone, but people who kind of gave up and were, and, lost the determination to live, he saw a correlation with those who gave up on there being any meaning in life. And we can imagine the, the inhuman uh, circumstances that people were forced to live through. But he saw that those who held on to a uh, 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 a sense of meaning, like I'm going to make it through because I want I want to live and I want to do something in the world and I'm not going to let them just kill me because they want to kill me, but they maintain the sense of purpose and, uh, and meaning in life. He said most of those people made it but those who at a certain point just couldn't fight and again we have no right to judge here but couldn't couldn't get the strength to see that there was any meaning left in life everything had become so uh cruel and bitter and nonsensical that it just they just just gave up. So having a sense of meaning and purpose is absolutely instrumental to not only a, a, a sense of joy, but just uh, the, the strength to live a meaningful life. And when we say having a meaning, this includes that what I do is meaningful. And especially in the eyes of God, that, that my life has meaning. And even more than that, that life itself has meaning. So Dennis Prager points out very, uh, very correctly that one of the factors that helps people in general have a sense of purpose and meaning is through religion. Because without religion or a philosophical uh, worldview that sees purpose to the world, 
see, from a, a, a strictly evolutionary worldview, there is, there is no intrinsic meaning or purpose to life. There is no direction. There's no, uh, there's no divinity. And we're here at, we can almost say almost by accident. Now, people can believe this and still find meaning in their own life. <clears throat> but in a certain way, that, that, that's like a hard position to take. In other words, I don't see that there's any intrinsic meaning to life. So a person adopts a, a, a position, I'll create my own meaning, my own purpose. So that could work. But for many people, I would say maybe even the majority of people in the world, that meaning and purpose is to survive and to have pleasure, which is exactly the description of the animal kingdom. Just the, 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 the will to survive and the will to experience pleasure. But on, on, on a soul level, on especially a divine soul level, the, the idea of purpose and meaning comes from that it is intrinsic in, the, in life itself. Life itself has intrinsic meaning. And I find my purpose and meaning within that context. So obviously, having a sense of meaning and purpose in most cases will lead to a very positive worldview that uh, I, I'm here because I have something to do. I have something to contribute. I, I find my life meaningful. Other people's lives are meaningful, and therefore I come to um, honor and respect other people, because just like I have a sense of meaning and purpose, so do others. And just as I want to be honored and respected, I must do the same for other people. But if you look at a person who adopts a worldview that um, this is this is a rat race. This is um, kill or be killed kind of world. Then it's 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 a very different kind of philosophy. It's a di very very different way to look at the world. And of course, if nothing matters and there's no intrinsic purpose and meaning, this is a recipe for doing all kinds of illegal, non-ethical, and non-moral kind of things, because why not? I need to survive. My sense of purpose in this world is to get the most that I can. So obviously, from a, a Jewish point of view, from a moral point of view, this is not the type of attitude that we want to have. But obviously, a lot of people fall into this. They fall into a life that has no, really no intrinsic meaning or purpose other than I'm here. Therefore, I should try to get the best I can out of it. But there's not this overriding feeling that I'm here for a purpose. I'm here, it could be from a previous lifetime to fix something. It could be an innate feeling that I have something to contribute to the world. That could be part of the fixing of previous lifetimes. But even taking away the whole concept of reincarnation, that uh, I, I, in general, religion gives people a 
a world view where things do matter. Things are important. Life is worth living. Um, and there is intrinsic meaning in life. And there's intrinsic meaning in all of creation. So going back to uh, a little bit from Dennis Prager, so he he mentions three different things, three general things that can give us a sense of meaning. The first one is relationships. That whether it's with parents or with children, with spouse, extended family, and we know in, in Judaism, and I'd say in every religious setting, family is so important. And when I talk about meaning and purpose, it, it could be I want to save the world. And it can be just simply I want to be a good father. I want to be a good mother. I want to be a good son and, or daughter. That is a tremendous purpose in the world. And uh, we know within a family setting how, how much we do give to family, how important family is. So that's one avenue of finding purpose. Now, we can extend it to friends. We can extend it to community. We could extend it to being part of a nation, Am Yisrael. It could be an American who actually really feels <laughs> like how important it is to be an American. And it could be being a human being and all these different levels where we can find purpose and meaning in being a good human being to being a good member of our society, to be a good member of our community, and of our immediate family. So this, Dennis Prager says, this, this gives so much meaning in life. And then there is work that obviously there are many people who are not all that connected to their work. They do it, they maybe even like it, or they deal with it. And then there is the type of work that we feel that this is what we're in the world to do. That this is, this is our contribution to society. This is our contribution to making a better world. And it can span the arts and the sciences, different professions. Um, even, even, for example, someone who has a business, it, it, it can bring great meaning and purpose into one's life of running an honest business. That I'm not just out to make as much money as I can, but... I, I am going to create a product that people need, that uh, people can depend on, that I treat every customer as I should. I don't rip off anyone. I don't fool anyone. I don't, uh, I don't uh, do all kinds of uh, under the table kinds of things to make more money. That also can bring very great purpose. And lastly, lastly, he brings the idea of causes that many times we become attracted to a cause. It could run a huge spectrum of types of causes. But it's something I really believe in. 
I want to support. I want to give my time, my energy, my money. And that brings tremendous meaning and purpose in life. In, in all of these, though, there is a downside. There, let's go back to relationships. There's a downside where, I'm just using this as an example, where parents try to live through their children. Meaning, in many cases, they try to, it, it could be very subconscious, control their children. In work, also, we could become workaholics and we get so much meaning out of our work, we uh, ignore our responsibilities to family, for example. So, okay, we get lots of meaning out of the work that we do, but it, has, it, it can have a downside as I just explained. And the same thing with causes. Causes are wonderful. They, they bring uh, lots of positive energy to the world. But many times people get involved in causes, not necessarily for the right reasons. And they, we also know that there are not so good causes fascism, Nazism. Um, at a certain point, at least the way it developed, communism. There are uh, all kinds of cults. So there are all kinds of causes that people can get involved with, not because they because it's positive. It's be a lot of times people are desperate to have some meaning in life. And so therefore they attach themselves to a cause to the extreme. And it actually becomes quite unhealthy. And one of the greatest causes is what we mentioned already is religion. That having a a, a, a sense of of a creator of a, a that there is direction in the world there's purpose in the world that I'm part of a community of people who have the same belief system all of this can bring great positive meaning and purpose in life So I see I, I took a little bit more time on the obstacles. <laughs> and, but no, but this, these were the good attitudes. So let me just add a few things from um, Rob Ginsburg here. And I'm, I'm going to limit this to the connection of Eretz Yisrael and joy. So in, in the book of Deuteronomy, in Devarim, there's a parasha, Ki Tavo. Bahaya Ki Tavo Ela Oretz. And it will be when you come into the land. And the Torah, Moshe, describe coming into the land. And, but, but the parasha begins with the word Vihaya. And it will be. And our sages tell us that when a parsha begins or a, a passage in the Torah with the haya, and it will be, it's a language of joy. So here, again, it's a very simple idea. The haya ki tavo el arts. When you come to the land, what a source of joy. What a source of joy. I am, I, I, I had an event last night and I mentioned I've been in Eretz Israel for 49 and a half years. 
this coming December will be 50 years. And I, I can honestly say, I still feel the joy of being in Eretz Israel. It is, it's real. And it, I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for being in Eretz Israel. So that's right out of the Parsha. Vahaya ki tavo ela Eretz. Now, a few Parshas after that, no, excuse me, excuse me, in the same Parsha, Vahaya ki tavo ela Eretz, there's what's called the blessing and the curse. The blessings are if we listen to God and we follow the Torah and we're good people and create a just society. So the blessings are manifold, manifold. Everything will be good and peaceful and productive and fruitful. But if we don't listen to God's word and we don't follow the Torah, there's 98 curses that follow. And towards the end of the, the curses, it says, it, it, it's the, the obvious reason why all of this is happening, because you didn't listen to the words of God. But other than that, it's just a list of all these terrible things that will happen. Unfortunately, when you read this parsha, it all came true. Every, every single prediction came true through the exile. But in one place, it gives a reason. And it just says very simply, because you did not serve God with joy and with the gratitude of having everything. And so this is quoted widely that exile came about because we didn't serve God with joy. Now, if it would have said, because you didn't serve God, well, that's the first reason. That's the reason given at the beginning of the curses. If you don't listen to the words of God, if you don't follow the Torah, this is what's going to happen. And, but here, we did the mitzvot. So we should have gotten all the blessings. Ah, but we didn't do the blessings with joy and gratefulness and appreciation for what we have. And that is, that's the simple text. That's the literal meaning. So this is like really a, a monumental statement here because you didn't serve God with joy. And this is the same thing on a personal level. Someone can be religious, can live an orthodox Jewish lifestyle, but can be a, a sad, depressed, angry, jealous person. Well, something is missing. <laughs> the joy is missing. And this person is depressed and angry and jealous because they are not doing the service of God and joy. Not the, not the opposite, not that they, they're not serving God with joy because they're depressed and angry. They're angry and depressed because they're not serving God with joy. And then there's, there's a, a known story that one of the students of the Tzemach Tzedek, the third of the Chabad Rebbe's, came to him and asked for a blessing to move to Eretz Yisrael. This is around the 1840s. And there were individuals who were actually making it to Eretz Yisrael, a very, very small elect group. Nonetheless, this man wanted to immigrate from Europe to Israel. And the Tzemach Tzedek would not give him a blessing. 
he could have foresaw that uh, first of all, it was so dangerous to even make the trip to Israel in those days. Very dangerous. And, and living in Israel then was incredibly hard. Incredibly hard. Nonetheless, people did come. And so the Tzemach Tzedek said to this man, make Eretz Yisrael here. In other words, there's a very important teaching that not everyone can be in Eretz Yisrael, or not everyone merits right now to be in Eretz Yisrael. God willing, everyone will. But Eretz Yisrael is, is a geographical place, but it's also a state of mind. That's why Rabbi Nachman, he spent nine months in Israel, and, he, and then he went back to Europe, and he never came again. But when anyone asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm always going to Eretz Yisrael. I'm always going to Yerushalayim. Because once you get Eretz Yisrael in your neshama, there is a way to make Eretz Yisrael wherever you are. It's not exactly the same, but there is a way to bring the, the joy, the consciousness, the spirituality of Eretz Yisrael into our, into our lives. And then there's a, a beautiful gematria, a beautiful gematria that when a Chatan and Kala get married, so they have what are called the Sheva Brachas. They have seven days of celebration. And each one is accompanied by a meal, which means that we ate bread. And therefore, there is a Birchat uh, Amazon. Uh, there's an uh, after grace blessing to say for the meal. But there's a special introduction when it's a, a Sheva Brachas, when there is a a groom and a bride there. And as part of it, it says that there be simcha b'mo'ano. Simcha b'mo'ano, means there's joyous in God's place. Because in another place in the Chumash, it, it, uh, it asks God to look down from his holy abode. And the word there is used is Ma'on. And so here, it's like God is celebrating with the Chatan and the Kala. That there's not just joy here in this world, but God also feels, God is also in this world, but God is everywhere. So in one of the heavens, one of the heavens is called Ma'on, one of the seven heavens. So even in this high heaven, there's joy from the Chata and the Kala. So Rav Ginsburg says an amazing thing. Simcha b'mo'ano is gematria Eretz Yisrael. 832. In other words, the joy of God, even though we imagine the joy of God being in this high, high heaven, but God is also here in Eretz Yisrael. And so God's rejoicing is with the Chatan and the Kala, and especially in Eretz Yisrael. Especially in Eretz Yisrael. So I'm just going to add to this. Some of you have heard this before. Every day, it comes from uh, Ezekiel. Baruch Kavod. Hashem Mim Komo. Blessed is the glory of God from his place. So the question is, which, which place of God are we talking about? So most people would imagine we're talking about in heaven. God's place is in heaven. And there's um, there's good reason for that. In Hallel, we say, Hashemayim, Shemayim Lashem. 
The heavens, that is the heavens of God. But the, the earth he gave to human beings. So this idea of God in heaven, there, there, there's something to it. But, <clears throat> excuse me, if you take the words kavod Hashem, the glory of God from his place, so glory, kavod equals 32. The name of Hashem is 26. 32 times 26 equals Eretz Yisrael, 832. So when you read this, blessed is the glory of God from his place. We could read it, his place is Eretz Yisrael. So that goes along with this idea, simcha b'mo'ano. There's joy in his, in his place. Equals 832. Okay, <clears throat> we're running a little bit late. Um, I'll end with a blessing here. The blessing is, first of all, that everyone can make it to Eretz Yisrael. Everyone should come home. But if you can't right now, make Eretz Yisrael wherever you are. Make Eretz Yisrael where you are.